while they may have a lot of people that have invested, it's a lot of time and energy to take someone from a very new beginning into, you know, a seasoned investor, you know. So it's a great resource for people. The majority of people trade time for money in the hopes of building wealth. I'm here to tell you that the traditional methods don't cut it anymore. Welcome to the Passive Income Power Podcast. My name is Doug Earthman. My partner, Mickey Bernstein, and I are going to dive deep into the power that passive income can have on your quality of life. We're going to discuss alternative assets, strategies, and insights through interviews with the very people who have found freedom through their power. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Passive Income Power Podcast. All right. Thank you for tuning in to the Passive Income Power Podcast. My name is Doug Earthman. And I'm Mickey Bernstein, and we have with us tonight Michael Wade, who's been a business and technology executive for over 15 years of experience as an entrepreneur, uh, an operator, and an advisor. Um, He's a diversified investor participating in transactions across multiple verticals, including energy, technology, healthcare, real estate, commodities, podcasting, and cryptocurrency. That's a lot of words for me. Um, I kind of have a long relationship with Michael um, as I'm a friend through his wife um, who has her own unique success story of her own. uh, And maybe we need to have her on a future podcast because I know a lot about that. Uh, And I've known Susan since she was about five years old. Imagine that. Um, Yes. um, And... Michael, you live where and have how many children? We have five kids. Oh, wow. Five kids. Yes. All Maybe. ages 10 and under, with the youngest being one. So just kind of stair <laughs> steps. So I knew there was a bunch. The house is busy, and it's about to get busier with summer break coming up soon. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I have two, and I'm, uh, I'm maxed out. I can't imagine... <laughs> I, I just can't even imagine five. You, you know, by the, by the first one, it's new. Everything's going. By the fifth one, it's like, hey, welcome. Here's the corner of the, the house. And <laughs> you, you kind of develop this little ecosystem, you know, so they self-manage a little bit, kind of pair up. And yeah, it's, it, it's so fun. Wow. I know exactly what you mean since I have seven in a blended family, but mine are all grown. So the good news for you two guys is um, when they grow up, you get – all these adult friends. Yes. And that's really nice. Um, Michael has a lot of experience um, in quite a few asset classes, including Bitcoin and energy and technology and real estate and healthcare and podcasting. So Michael, please tell us a little bit more about yourself and the services you offer to your customers. Yeah, kind of, kind of a backstory. My great, great grandmother, started a home health care company in Memphis, Tennessee, back in 1965. Um, and in the mid-80s, my father kind of branched off, created another health care company there in Nashville, started the second branch. Um, you know, so I grew up in this entrepreneurship family. My dad was a coder, developer. Uh, I remember being young, going into the office and would sit up there, the you know, back in the day when you actually cash checks and they had these little things called adding machines. It's my favorite thing. When the nurses would come in at the end of the week, they actually had cash, they would pay them. And I'd sit up there and I'd help my dad kind of count it and do the adding machine. He had to do it twice, make sure it balanced. I don't even know if half the people even know what those things are these days. <laughs> but, um, you know, from a, he coded DOS, uh, was did patents and did like Western wear back when in the nineties and just very entrepreneurial. So I grew up around this entrepreneurial family, just creative, innovative technology focused. Um, you know, so kind of, kind of the story after I graduated college told my dad, Hey, I'm done. I finished time to get to work. Let's come back to the family business. He said, not yet. He said, you need to go, go get a job, go work at a corporation, go get some experience, get, Get things under your belt. And he said, if you decide you want to come back to family business, you can. You have a home here, but you just can't walk in. I was like, oh, goodness. Okay. Um, So kind of pretense to that, one of my best friends passed away in a car accident. And 
stayed really close touch with his family. And right after I graduated, Mark, uh, who actually worked at HCA, called me and said, hey, got this startup company. Think, you know, you'd be interested in it. Maybe you can go check it out. Um, ended up meeting some of the most incredible leaders in healthcare. Um, you know, so some of the early stages, stage, excuse me, stages of my career, early career, you know, getting into the corporate world, it, it all started with just this incredible leadership, you know, so the CEO to the COO are just phenomenal leaders, you know, so that short period of time, they just pushed, pushed really hard from, we, we worked on developing applications, solutions, we were coding Ruby on Rails. I, I remember back then, I think it was like 2011 or so, we were trying to take our, so we, we merged clinical and pharmacy data. Um, and so we were trying to, trying to take this healthcare database and we were trying to go into Amazon Web Services, the, the AWS. And at that time, they weren't HIPAA and high trust certified. So we spent all this time migrating to the cloud only to realize we had to go back to data centers. Uh, you know, so with, with what we were doing, building call centers. So when I, when I walked in, there were six of us. Um, Brad Tice, great guy. Uh, he was actually, you know, the president for the APHA Board of Pharmacy. Just, I'm telling you, incredible leaders could not have asked for just a better group to kind of push that early leadership and that, that early career. Um, they, they kind of pushed me to go into predictive modeling. So back before analytics, or I'm sorry, before AI, you know, we called a lot of this analytics, analysis, algorithms, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, working with some actuarials and really started studying the fundamental, really got into like data analytics, you know, from coding. So I understood computers and databases and structures and I really just kind of diving into data analytics. And, um, you know, it's about three years, worked my way up three and a half to director of operations of the company. Um, you know, and it was kind of a, one of those blessings, but in hindsight, you're like, ah, Got achieved a Six Sigma black belt for, you know, all the business things you can do with this kind of the tool belt for statistical modeling and process and change. And was working with the COO and he said, hey, you know, you're a little too young to kind of, you know, and plus next level up is me. I was like, man. So put in my two weeks, a few days later, just it's like, all right, I'm going to go to the family business. And at that healthcare company was a private equity backed company. You know, so as we were building and growing, we were we achieved profitability in three years, but it was a very heavily backed company. So you can go and say, hey, I want to do this or I want to do this. And within reason, you know, get funding, step over to the family business. By this time, my dad has kidney failure. You know, it's been a, about a year or so, um, you know, kind of battling with some of this stuff. And when I stepped in, the business was kind of on the decline. It was just, you know, breaking even a little bit in the red, depending on, you know, kind of, it was right there teetering. Um, and so we started, I jumped in, dove in, started, you know, taking all the knowledge and reapplying, started growth. And I realized really quick, I was like, hold on, I got to do my own line of credit. If I'm going to scale this to any other city, I've got to raise capital. I've never done that before. Like never done that before. Um, you know, in a tandem of this with, with Mickey, my wife, who was a nurse, started making some great money also. Um, you know, so we were able to use that along with what I was doing. And instead of fighting healthcare and fighting, you know, the people that I worked with and loved, I wanted to join them, you know, so just to kind of make a quick story, I started investing in healthcare with them. So healthcare IT companies, healthcare startups kind of got plugged in. Um, and it's, it's a strong group where if you get to pitch night, kind of shark tank night, you have to go through a lengthy process. And so it, it, it was a fundamentally strong group, just amazing group. Um, and so that, that was really kind of my, my health care. But then I kind of was going, well, okay, well, what's next? You know, so real estate, I loved real estate. Uh, so home ownership, our, you know, we, we bought a little home, fixed it up a little bit, you know, and just got to kind of experience home ownership. You know, what's that like? You know, there's actual maintenance. There's this thing called property tax and mortgages and escrow and all these things, you, you know, you're renting and now you're owning and you, you've heard about them until you have to like put it together. You know, there's a lot to it. You know, I didn't realize at one point you could actually take escrow out of the picture and pay yourself, you know, or property taxes. 
And there's all these different things you start learning and you learn how to maintenance. And so it just fascinated me. And I heard everybody just, there was a guy that I worked with up north in Michigan who was investing in real estate and he was loving it and was doing very successful, just passive income, but he would just go out and buy properties cash or, you know, just door knock and doing all these, these things. And, you know, I said, okay, well, let, let me start with one, you know, so started with one property and then got another property, you know, and, and realized pretty quickly, okay, there, there's this kind of a scale there. If you're gonna go residential, you know, there's turnover after a year, a lot of maintenance. Um, then I met a guy who was building a hotel Indigo, beautiful property. It was in this perfect prime location right off at a, um, a college down South, right between the college and there was a conference center and it was right beside the conference center. And I was so excited. I was like, oh man, this is my first bigger deal I can get into, you know, participate in his family owned the land. Well, come to find out there was eight feet of land that the college fought over for the property. And you can't build the property with, you know, eight feet. And it stayed for a year, year and a half, two years, you know, they were going through litigation. Um, Ultimately, they decided just to sell it off to somebody else. But it was it was one of those moments where you find like, man, this is perfect prime location, perfect opportunity. You know, hotel and go boutique, a boutique hotel or a deal fell through. I was devastated, um, you know, and at the same time, I started kind of looking around. And, you know, when you find strong teams like the healthcare team, there's there's that trust factor of let, let, let them at least get to do the due diligence pitch night you know, and make considerations, you know, and so in real estate, I was kind of trying to find my team. And so I had a friend call me from college. He was a CPA. He worked his way up, made a very reputable company there in Nashville, moved out to Vegas, then to Santa Monica, California. And I got this random phone call. I'm quitting my job. And I mean, this guy's done a reverse. He's done everything, taking companies public. I mean, just very, very, very smart. I was like, Rob, what are you doing? Like, hold on, you're doing this thing called cryptocurrency. You're quitting your job. And I promise you at this point, he goes, I'm even thinking about selling my car. I was like, hold on, don't sell your car. Like, you're doing this thing. You're starting a fund for cryptocurrency. You're leaving your CPA. I knew nothing about cryptocurrency. And this is about late 2015, early 2016. Um, and I said, you know, Sometimes you got to buy the jockey before the horse. So I said, I'll give you some money, but I want to kind of plug in and learn. And that was kind of the start of cryptocurrency as it is. Um, so we made a lot of mistakes, just like everyone else in the 16, 17, you know, a lot of fun stories, but there was a lot of time where, you know, doing the due diligence you think you're doing on other deals aren't the same and applicable for other industries. You know, so we, the, the things you go through and look at from team and, you know, okay, well, what have they done? And let's read the white paper. Let's go through all of the details. Some of those projects didn't even lift at all, even though they were semi-decent ideas. Um, so, the, you know, just kind of, that's kind of a brief background, the starting point. Um, you know, and then there were some other things I started getting into and I'd love to share more about that. That's awesome. That is a uh, very diverse and unique uh, pathway from, uh, I guess, college, uh, really, and we haven't even gotten to where you are now. Uh, but that's a that's a unique journey. So were you <clears throat> when you were doing? So you you went healthcare, and then you went back to your family's healthcare company. When you started buying real estate, uh, single family residential, were you still working for your family's company or were you doing that as your income? I was not. No, no. So no more family company. Um, okay. So, yeah, so I was at home and investing, learning, investing, you know, you know, from the experience of going in the family company of not understanding and what is, what is angel investing? How do you structure deals? What, what teams do you assemble? How do you raise capital? You know, so it was, it was kind of the early formation. Um, what was really neat about that, that group, uh, it's called New Cura in Nashville, is that they actually paid for what's called the ACA, the Angel Capital Association. 
And so it's for new early stage investors. There's a lot of content education. Uh, there's a great lady there, Sarah Dickey, that runs a lot of that, that there. I just plugged in, just learned and just listened. Uh, there was regional conferences where other, so it's kind of like an umbrella kind of a, within you know, the angel groups. So they're kind of a, an organizational umbrella you can kind of plug into. So they'll have regional conferences. And, you know, so I would travel around a little bit. And I remember going following one of the CFOs for one of the healthcare portfolio companies down to Louisiana to see him speak and just engaged. It was at Tulane and met some incredible people there. Um, you know, but there's, it's an organization for investing. They do conferences and it's a great starting point, you know, for a lot of people that want to learn or want to learn about angel investing or what is it. You know, because so, a, yeah. a lot of times groups, while they while they may have a lot of people that have invested, it's a lot of time and energy to take someone from very new beginning into, you know, a seasoned investor. You know, so it's a great resource for people. Yeah, that that's very similar to to what our model is is to to educate people about the investing process. Can you so? Angel investing. Can you just break that? What What does that What does that mean? Can you define angel investing? Be, be, I I personally don't know a lot about it. The kind of back step. First goal when people get, you know, in their early career, I always tell them your first goal is to become an accredited investor. You know, so if you don't know what that is, it's very simply the SEC, not the football, but the Security Exchange Commission. They want to have some 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 way to say okay. If you put some money in here, there's risk, you know, if, and if you're making, you know, let's say 60 or 80,000 a year and you put 20, 30,000 in, in, in some, some type of private deal, that could really hurt you. Like it could be a significant impact on your finances, you know, so there's, there's a threshold level and they have qualifications, which, you know, I know this is a seasoned podcast with a lot of credit investors, mm -hmm. but just to kind of, for those that are new, I always tell that's the first step is learn that, learn what it is, what it means. If you're an individual, you're unmarried, it's 200,000 a year for two years, 300,000 for, you know, married couples or a million dollars in net worth, excluding your home. You know, there's other stuff for, for, you know, if you're an LLC or entity or, you know, there's if CPAs, there's all different regulations that say, Hey, you're, you're sophisticated enough to at least take your own risk. You know, so that, that's kind of step one is, entering that wheelhouse. You know, I read the Robert Kiyosaki book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, fundamentally changed. It was one of the first books that I read that go, aha moment, like that makes oh, yeah. sense. You same. know, so there, there's these, <laughs> these levels, you know, that you kind of progress through. And the same thing with investing, there's also different levels. So angel investors are just imagine individuals. There can be an individual or a group, you're accredited, and there's a plethora of those that are participants and active or passive. And as, as you kind of go up, up, go up the ladder, you'll begin to get into more, you know, family office, which are families with wealth. And then you go private equity, venture capital. So it, it's kind of more dollars are deployed all in, and then institutional, you know, so there, there's these levels. So this is, this is not really the, it's more of your own money, not someone else's. You know, a lot of times private equity will raise capital from someone else deployed. Most angels are deploying their own capital. You know, so there's different deal structures. Some take as minimum as 5,000 a deal. I've seen some as low as that. I've seen others that have a 50, 100,000 100, threshold. You know, so every deal is different. It's all private deals. Yeah, so it's private deals outside of the stock market. So in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, 401ks, IRAs, if you're not an accredited investor, that's primarily the vehicle because there's a risk mitigation there. You know, some of the, the, the deals that are on the platforms have been verified. They've looked at risk. They've, they've offered some of the vehicles, standard vehicles. To be able to get private deals outside of the traditional markets, that's where accredited investor status allows you. It opens the window of opportunity. You know, and, and some of that also goes back to when was the SEC, do these rules established? You know, it was pre-internet. You know, so there's a lot of conversation I've had that I would love one day to say, you know, the Internet's brought information. You think real estate agents used to have to teach you about every single thing about a home, about a neighborhood, a school, or just kind of fine plate. And nowadays you have this access to information. Same thing's happening. You know, so I would love one day for maybe if, 
based on a certain percent of income, you know, to have certain deal opportunities. But some of the most amazing deals that I've seen have been in the private market. So they're off the, you know, the traditional vehicles. Um, and, that, and that's really where, you know, you are doing your own risk mitigation. You can team up with other angels or groups to help, you know, do diligence and risk and look at investing. Well, let me clarify one thing. Are, are you part of a angel investing group yourself? How do people find angel investors? Um, ACA is a phenomenal resource. Every All groups that are listed there, they have plenty of groups there listed. So they can actually connect you because each group may have a different focus or thesis. Some may be very healthcare specific, some technology specific. Um, Conferences are a great place to find and just ask around, you know, if you, if you know someone, even real estate, a lot of real estate people will know people that are doing deals or, you know, investing. So the answer is both. I do private deals. Plus I've done some with the groups, you know, as an individual. Okay. So there were, there was this term founders team when considering investment and Tell us what that means and how important it is and what are the qualities you look for in entrepreneurs you back and how do you assess their potential for success? Yes. Well, I think first and foremost, it, I resemble a lot of this also with kind of like dating relationships first. Before you get into any TAM, total addressable market, before you get into deals, who is the person you're talking to? You know, because if some of these deals can be five, seven years, some of them can be longer, you know, depending on. And my personal thesis is finding people that I like to share life, share life with. And some of that first is, are you willing to pick up a phone call if they call? Are you willing to ha- spend time with them outside of the business? And I know that's maybe not spoken about a lot, but there's a relationship a conversation. There's life that's shared first. Um, you know, so I really focus on who they are first as an individual. Um, it, it's some of the people that I've invested with are some of my best friends. Oh, you know, we've, we've grown relationship over time. Our families have traveled together, even, you know, now living in Dallas, when I traveled back to Nashville, you know, one of the uh, guys I invested with his podcast, he actually lives in Nashville now and our family stayed at his house. You know, that was from 2017 when I first did a, an angel check into his company. You know, so it's, it, it's a shared life first. It's something that I think is super important because character is, it matters. You know, it's you know, like the old handshake. If, you know, at the end of the day, all you have is your character. It's who you are. Um, you know, so it's, that, that's kind of the first filter. The second filter would be, you know, idea. What are they doing? You know, to have they, you know, a lot of the angel groups will look at, you know, kind of founder profile. There, there is some of that. So have they left a higher paying job where they found a need? Maybe they were working for a company. They saw this big need, so they left it, it, and they're out. And they're like, hey, I've been doing this. I know this industry, you know, we need this. You know, there's, there's others that maybe they had a few exits. There's other newer founders that are just getting started. You know, so there's there's a whole diverse founder porf- profile per se. Um, you, you know, it never I never negated all of them, but it's also the combination of who's the team around them as well. You know, so do they understand? Have they do they even understand what gap certified financials are? Do they understand have they how to operate a business? You know, because in the early days, there's a lot of wearing hats as well. You know, so what what team surrounding you that believes in this also, you know, do you have someone in technology or marketing, you know, who's your team? Because if you give capital, there needs to be a deployment of it. You know, how are you going to utilize that? Um, So, so team and founder are really, I think for myself first, that's what I look at as well as kind of the pathway, Um, you know, and, and looking at, okay, well, what's the thesis? What are we investing in? What makes sense and why, you know, and some of that comes, next because everyone likes to throw out i love when you go to angel meetups or pitch night they're like i have this idea i have no no customers but it's an eight million valuation or 10 i'm like what how'd you get there 
You know, it's an idea. Um, you know, there's others that have fundamental business, maybe they bootstrap for a little bit. Now they're raising capital. Those, I, I love finding those that maybe haven't explored the idea of raising capital, you know, and, and teaching and learning and saying, hey, there is, there is a way that you can have others come and support you where, you know, it's, it's also their relationships that can come alongside your business as well as the capital, you know, and it just, and, and there's also a time and place for bank credits and, and credit lines and facilities and loans. And, you know, do you know how to navigate some of that? You know, there's, there's a lot of pathways, but I'd say that at the fundamental of starting a founder, you know, because everyone likes to throw out this big total addressable market, you know, oh, it's, we could achieve this if we just get 1%, you know, but I've, I've also really focused on, okay, can we first make the stages of growth, you know, from step A to maybe the product or service, and can we get customers? Can I see this growing into a first a 10, 20, $30 million company feasibly before it gets bigger and does it have room to scale from that? You know, so there's different growth phases and sometimes it's okay to fund a company where, you know, the goal is to get it up to maybe 30, 40 million and sell it. And that's okay too. And there's others that, you know, if you think about everyone, everyone goes back home and has that restaurant, that nostalgia, you know, there, there, there is a certain value in traditional legacy type businesses, you know, and I think that has been lost a little bit in this, this window, you know, internet has shrunk our attention span, private equity, venture capital shrunk the timeline. They're trying to provide this monetary energy for speed with a shrunk timeline. And it is hard to look out 10 years, but I, I think there's so much value also in some of those foundational companies. Like if you find someone that really truly is going to dedicate who they are to this, this pathway, there, there is some value in that if you believe in that also, you know, so I, I think there's a balance, you know, and so I use kind of the baseball analogy. I know some go for 50, hundred X, they want to find the unicorns. I've always tried to just bat and get on base. If I get on base and we can make customers and we can grow first, I want to, I want to hit singles, doubles, a few triples. And then all of a sudden you're going to find your home run. You know, you're going to find that skill. You're going to find that pathway. Um, and so that, that's really been, I think some of the biggest to answer your question a little bit, you know, how I look at teams and a little bit of the structure. Tell us about the, uh, current company you're at King operating. Yeah. How did you sure. land there and, and what kind of, uh, assets are y'all, um, uh, raising capital for? Yes. Yeah, so I think it's a fun story how we got here to begin with. Um, <clears throat> living in Nashville, healthcare investing, some real estate. My wife and I got this wild hair to move to Florida. Everybody wants to go live on the beach. And to be honest, we timed it perfectly. We lived right by Siesta Key, this beautiful beach. In 2019, June of 19 is when we landed. So when the pandemic happened, it was like we had the beach to ourselves. It was mm -hmm. phenomenal. But we quickly realized, like, you know, there I started importing commodities, you know, cheese and whole dairy. And we just realized with, with, with four kids at the time, we're from, you know, a place with seasons. We're from a place with sports and, you know, and Florida's phenomenal. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. We were just wanting to raise our kids somewhere. So at the end of 2020, um, I sent Susan on a plane. I said, go find a house. Just figure it out. I don't care where you go. Um, just go find something. So she chose Texas and my dad's from here. Uh, he passed away in 15, but you know, we would visit 12, 13. We considered moving up this direction, always loved Texas. And I'd asked her, I was like, you want to move back to Nashville? I'm like we still got our house there. I started renting it out after we left. I didn't want to sell the family home. You know, it's always that safety net of like, okay, we maybe we can go back to something. And she's like, no, let's, let's go on a journey. I said, okay, let's do it. So we moved to Texas. Uh, the first guy I met in Texas, this guy, Eric, uh, we were at the little neighborhood with a little community center and I saw him sitting there and he had a really cool shirt. I was like, man, I like your shirt. And he goes, oh, you want to sit down? I was like, yeah, let's sit down. We started talking about gold, silver, hard assets and learned a lot, ton about him, you know, from quantum biology, he had research labs, public, public companies he built. And I said, well, what are you doing in Texas? He said, I don't know. He said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know either. <laughs> My wife found his house and I followed. <laughs> I said, be honest with you. Um, 
And so for about a year and a half, you know, in Nashville and in Florida, energy was not the, the deal opportunity never really truly existed. I didn't stumble across it. I didn't stumble across. And then in Texas, you hear energy. It's it's there's an ocean of energy here. You know, so I started just really researching companies, learning about the industry. It took me about a year and a half, two years um, before I actually made my first investment here. And so that, that's kind of what led me here. And so the company I'm actually with, I was originally an investor. Um, and with the tech experience and tech background, um, I walked in. They were kind of a reboot at the time, about 17 employees came and rebuilt the identity management, cybersecurity infrastructure. This really cool thing that I, I just learned and had, had heard of, it's called GIS. So you can actually, if in real estate, there's topography and subterranean analysis. And you can look below the ground and see things and you can watch, you know, digging and you do updates and it just blew my mind. And I was helping move some of these new systems and grow it to new data centers. It's just phenomenal. So I did about a four to six month project. It's, it was about it was about four months. Um, and then my wife and I decided we were going to go on a three week vacation in November for Thanksgiving. So we left and the whole time I was sitting there going, I love the team. They're amazing. And for the four months, they had asked me to join, just asked me to participate, you know, just helping them out. Um, so by the time I got back, they made one more phone call. And I called Eric and I was like, look, I love it here. I, we're at that point. We've been here in Texas almost two years. My wife and I are debating either planning the flag here and staying or going to go back to Tennessee. And he said, oh, look, I'm going to give you one more shot because we want you here. And I was like, OK. I was like, I, and I, I loved the family here that just is like a fan. It was almost like a family office. Um, loved the team and committed in December just to come full time. So kind of full circle investor to employees. My first actual W-2 probably in 10 years. Full W. No, no, I take that back. I did another W-2 in Texas before just helping. It was helping an IT company doing some advisory roles to help them scale and grow. Phenomenal family. Um, but it was it was just kind of, I think, God's timing at the same time, you know, learning about energy. And so kind of transversing this, Bitcoin actually got me into energy. So there's actually Bitcoin is an energy backed asset. So kind of from way back, you know, learning one thing may transition into something else. You know, the experiences you have one place can be transferable. You know, so I started learning about store of value, medium exchange, unit of account, this thing called Bitcoin mining. And and this company, kind of why I also decided to invest here is they're, they are real estate, very similar to commercial real estate. They go and acquire property. So the mineral rights land lease, they'll develop the property. And just like real estate, there's value add. But one of the unique things where I originally first invested is I sold one of my residential properties. And there was a tax benefit from 75 to 80% deduction in year one. So there was accelerated deduction. Appreciation, yeah. Yes. And so there was this tax benefit where I didn't do a 1031 exchange, you know, with, with the residential property. And to be honest, I hadn't done one before. So I was kind of like a little nervous of going through the process and identifying. And one day I will do some of actually what's cool is we're actually building a 1031 exchange here. So from my, my timidness, I kind of am now helping and facilitate and learning about 1031s. Um, and so the land development company, there's active and passive investing in real estate. You know, you get better benefits being active versus passive. You know, and with act, being active, a certain number of hours, you have to take notes and keep track and records of everything you do, car mileage, logs, what you did on the properties. The benefits here is you can actually achieve a lot of the pass. I'm sorry, the, a lot of the active benefits being passive. So it was right in that middle wheelhouse of real estate and angel investing private equity type deals set right in the middle, you know, with monthly, just monthly dividends, just like you have a tenant. If you build a 10 story building, you have tenants They're they're digging holes, selling production and you get monthly income checks. So was, there was a lot of similarities and overlaps with real estate. The difference is after you get the property, rather than building a building, you know, you have your engineer and geo teams decide how to 
do the tech, you know, the technical engineering for drilling. And so there, real estate is there, there's, there's a lot of similarities to it, you know, so kind of having that fundamental understanding of land, because you still have to go through title royalties negotiation. It is a full real estate transaction, you know, and so we have currently 40,000 acres in a portfolio, 20,000 be in the per, in the permit with one landowner. And that's very rare. So you get to negotiate with one person for title. Most of the time, if you find five, 10,000 acres, maybe 20, you may have a hundred people. You have to go through title and royalties with every single, it can be a long transaction. You know, so it is fundamentally sound in real estate, but also the scarcity, you know, so there's proven reserves. So you look at, well, what's there? So just like real estate development, if you buy some land, you go, well, am I gonna, am I gonna build a apartment building, a multifamily building? Is this gonna be a residential neighborhood? You know, so you have to make land decisions in energy, just like you do in real estate. So the, the geo and land teams make some of those technical decisions as we're acquiring the land, what to do with it. So that, that's kind of how I got into energy a little bit. And there was also a direct ownership of the energy. So traditionally, if you were to invest in oil and gas, an operator would go acquire, let's say, let's keep it simple, 500 acres. They'll raise capital from investors. And maybe you own three or five of the drills, you know, the wells that they would drill. And you'll hold those for 40 years. You know, so you, you, you'll basically you know, have that ownership piece. Well, the operator would go get another 500 acres, do the same thing, but you had no overlap between property A and property B. And so this company actually developed a portfolio model, very similar to commercial real estate, where it's all the wells, all the land, everything together, not just one property. So it's almost aligning the operator with the investor on the same side of the table. So that, and that, and that model fascinated me that made sense to me with the commercial real estate, you know, it kind of de-risked me going, okay, well, why do I have this, this property? If you're choosing properties, I allow the operator to kind of facilitate the entire transaction too. So it's more of a blind pool fund that you're raising capital uh, over a certain amount of time. And the operator has the, uh, autonomy to go out and buy the land and operate the uh, uh, business plan on drilling and pulling the resources out. So we'll, we'll actually acquire the land prior to port, like capital raise, <clears throat> so the land acquisition. So we'll have, we'll have at least some of it structured. We'll also leave room for additional acquisitions. We'll at least have some of that structured. So a lot of the capital is actually raised for op, for the more capital you can raise, the faster you can deploy your, your strategy. So, for example, a lot of the operators, they have almost a minimum viable operation. It just depends. Everything's so different. But just to kind of give an example, let's say there was a property we acquired and this property to maintain operating rights in perpetuity. You have to at least do, you know, do two wells a year. You know, so there's 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 contracts with each of the landowners for some type of operations. So you kind of already have a minimum viable operation, but all, you can also look at it and go, well, here's all the proven reserves. Here's what we'd like to do. So you can get your, the geo and land teams together and, and get a fairly good estimate on what it would take capital wise to do what you want to do. You know, and rather than hold it 40 years, <clears throat> we have like basically a three to five year window. We're developing just like when you add value in real estate, you add value in the land, the, the property value goes up. And so there's a three to five year exit window to actually sell to pension funds, private equity, the, some of the majors. Um, and what's fascinating is some of the majors, you know, they're, they're NAV the last few years. Macro wise, it's, it's part of the reason why I invested and I'm here. You know, the majors were not doing a lot of new production. There's been ESG. They're the narratives of, you know, climate change, you know, 70s, it was global cooling. No, it was global warming and now it's climate change. You know, and it, there is, I think all of us can agree fundamentally on we want the best for this planet. I, I don't think there's, you know, it's it's like the political tensions are always polar opposite, but actually there's a lot of similarities more than differences. Um, you know, and the more I started digging into some of the stuff, you realize, you know, even if we had full car batteries, you know, batteries are conduits of electricity. They don't create electricity. 
Right. <clears throat> There's still got to be inputs. You know, to create all these batteries in the U.S., the cobalt, lithium, all the mining facilities, everything we have for the metals, we don't have quite enough production, even just in reserves. We're going to have to really ramp that up. You know, and if you look at the global economy, if some countries aren't start, starting to trade, you have BRICS that created U.S. dollar. I mean, there's there's a lot of pathways we can take it, but you're going, even if you had the electric vehicles, well, now you got to change the grid because there's they're going to charge at night. Maybe they incentivize you to charge during the day. You know, there's there's grid. So I believe in energy abundance. You know, I, I, that's fundamentally what I believe in. And I know a lot of people are trying to control energy or control supply and limit and restrict. But I'm like, hey, energy is actually, if you look from the 1900s through today, we've taken more people out of poverty. Even with if you look at coal, natural gas and oil and all the others, there's energy poverty. And so one of the, I think the future drivers for a lot of the third world countries will be propane. And people don't talk about it. So people are still chopping wood in a lot of these countries, deforestation, that's happening. And just like we build water aqueducts and, and pathways to get water to people where they're not having to travel five miles and bring their water back and it's cleaned and, you know, same thing for cooking. And cooking is a very big thing. If you can supply people with propane, that is gonna be a fundamental shift for cooking. And that's just one of the small little, you know, focuses of the future. Um, you know, so transmission, battery storage, you know, we still have the same double A we have when I was a kid today. Same double A. There hadn't been much innovation there. You know, so I, I think we're being a technologist, I think we're on the early phase of energy tech. And I ask a lot of people, I'll say, hey, how many people you know in energy technology? Very few, you know, and it, some, you know, you, you should also think maybe Tesla. I, I believe Tesla was the tip of the spear. It brought conversation to the forefront because five years ago, we didn't have energy conversations and, and, and a lot of them, maybe seven. We didn't have these energy conversations in a lot of the investment, you know, networks that I'm part of. Now it's just common, you know, energy is in the forefront. And you think energy storage, energy transmission, you know, says electrons go down the line, there's energy loss. You know, so if we just increase the grid capabilities by 20, 30 percent, we'll save a lot of energy there, too. You know, so there's a lot of focuses that aren't talked about, um, you know, and still there's actually natural gas has been oil and gas industry. There's petrochemicals, you know, and so everything we've done with ESG, everything we've done with solar and wind, it still only accounts for two percent of the total energy supply. It's a very small fraction. And it's also variable, you know, solar ramps up in the day, slows down at night. And so, you know, kind of the Bitcoin thesis there is, well, some of these, you know, let's just keep it simple, remote data centers, you know, remote data centers kind of movable. If solar ramps up and there's too much energy, generators actually become less efficient with too much energy exponentially. So there's like this balance. You need to take energy off the grid, the load. You need to reduce the load. So the Bitcoiners can actually ver have variable supply on the energy grid to take some of the excess you know, capacity of the energy that would have been wasted and now being used. And the oil and gas fields, there's flare gas. I'm sure you've heard of the flare gas being mined. You know, so where, it was, where, where energy was wasted, now it's being used. And this energy thesis, when I say abundance, is because there is a cost of energy. You know, and so the Bitcoiners, we look at it going, actually, it's incentivizing those to actually find the cheapest cost of energy. So I, I truly believe that Bitcoin will eventually incentivize the innovation in the energy space because you're going to want to be incentivized to maybe look at fusion, geothermal, nuclear, other alternative sources. And there's plenty more coming. You know, you get start getting into quantum stuff. And, you know, so it incentivizes you to do the research and development because if you're you want to be lowest cost of energy. You know, so if energy factors come in, it's going to drive that innovation in the energy space. So I think we're just at that very forefront um, in, in our company here, or the energy company, as we're acquiring land, there's a portfolio. You know, so as we sell to majors or private equity and some of the people come and buy the wells for 40 years from us, you know, others want to do working interest by a portion of the portfolio or the entire thing, you know, but there's some deals that aren't tr in the traditional model that, you know, the gas pipelines aren't there yet. You know, they're building a lot of natural gas, you know, LNG facilities. 
you know, and, and the gas pipelines may not be out. So there's kind of stranded energy, but they may be there in six months, you know, so operationally there's these questions of, okay, well, this didn't fit into our traditional model. Maybe where we passed before there's new opportunities in the future, you know, but being part of that land team and that land analysis was so fundamentally important for me to have the in-house geo and land teams to look at the land and do the analysis to look and see, well, what possibilities are there? So kind of long form answer for a question. Yeah, but that's a good segue for where I'm going next. And that's fascinating what you're saying. And you seem to be a wealth of knowledge. Um, but this landscape um, startup thing is constantly evolving. And how do you stay up to date with emerging technologies and market trends and all the other investment opportunities? Yeah. So for each investment pathway, uh, y'all remember RSS feeds? They've kind of died out a little bit, but RSS feeds are these feeds of news and information updates. So mainstream media provides a narrative, an update of information. You can find a lot of good resource and content. You can also ask the people actually in the industry what they see. You know, so for each of the investments that I've done, and that's kind of what drove me also into being kind of a diversified investor is I wanted direct conversations and updates from that industry, from that team. So monthly updates, some new quarterly, you know, I, I, when, when the pandemic happened, I called for, you know, directly called one of the doctors that ran a clinical research facility. You know, so you have, you have information pathways that can allow you to stay up to date or the resources to ask the questions when you need them. You know, so there's, there's that tool of making sure that you kind of maintain because you know, unfortunately, in this global, we're, we're global now. It's not like just, you know, before you just had to worry about it. You know, if the business in your city were to overtake you with customers, you know, we're, we're in a different environment where if you're not at least vigilant of the macro while also knowing the micro, that macro, things can shift, you know, just like the banking crisis that we've had, things shift. If you're not aware of some of the macro and some of the different things that are happening, it can take you out of your business if you're not staying kind of up to date. In some of the different industries, um, so that, that that's really been kind of how I've done it is is funded the people I believe in, but also leaned on them for resource information and updates. Yep, we we always learn a lot from our um, customers, and we learn a lot from the people that are guests on our podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, if somebody is designing a healthy portfolio of investments. What are some considerations that you would advise? First and foremost, if you're married, I'll always be in agreement with your spouse. Anything you ever do, that's been fundamental. Anything I've ever done, making sure Susan's involved, knowing what's happening. Um, you know, make sure you've got, got kind of, I love part of the Dave Ramsey stuff, you know, grew up around Dave. I love at least having some type of, safety net get to a point first where you're comfortable before you start taking risk <clears throat> investing goes out on a risk curve savings is different than investing you know so you always say you know everyone says it's a cliche you know invest the money you're willing to lose and i, I kind of get that but th there's kind of more to it you know so definitely go and talk to those that have invested before you don't ever go alone go plug in, watch and learn, and don't go, you don't have to chase every deal. It's okay. The, the hardest part is actually saying no. Even, even if you think it's great and you're capable, the hardest part is no, because there's a lot of deals, a lot of deal flow, and just really taking it step by step going, hey, I want to learn one thing and focus. So I want to take, use the investing as also a knowledge learning. And then you have to also consider liquidity, you know, so there's different, you know, real estate has passive income. If you're going to go into some of the angel investments, you may have deals locked up for seven years, you know, so there's a little, there's a liquidity understanding, you know, and there's also hard assets. You can buy gold and silver, which are, you know, U S dollars are the IOUs to the banks, you know, so it's a bearer asset. So there's bearer assets. So, you know, focus on, I wouldn't say full portfolio diversification first because everyone, you know, you just, if you're just starting, start step one 
and learn what learn about whatever you're investing in and truly learn it. You know, maybe it's gold. Maybe you want to understand the history of money. 1971, Nixon took the gold off the gold, you know, the gold standard. You know, what 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 event what did that what what happened? Why why is gold important? Why has it been historically important? Central banks are buying gold. You know, so learn learn step one, but also kind of, you know, there's that custody and there's also the active versus passive. You know, if you have the chance to be involved, ask to be involved, even if you're just step, dropping by, if it's a local company, drop by, learn, plug in, be a resource, you know, but so there's liquidity, um, there's active versus passive, and then, you know, some of the different diversifications you'll get into, you know, you, you may not figure out right, right off the bat, maybe you just want to start focusing on real estate. You're going to learn so many fundamentals of investing and, and following people that have done stuff that it's transferable into other things as well. You know, Michael, uh, how can our viewers contact you? Um, if they want to seek your services or just inquire and suck your brain for a little knowledge. <laughs> I, I'm on LinkedIn. I actually got back on LinkedIn. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn, happy to share my email address. I think it's easy if someone wants to shoot an email, uh, just ask a question, a simple question. Uh, so it's mwade02 at gmail.com. I mean, just direct email. Um, love, I, I, I enjoy, and maybe I don't have the answers, but happy to, you know, navigate you to those that are different experts in different fields or, you know, connect you with local groups or whatever it is. And, you know, so I would say just, you know, the, the more personal, the better. And I do check my LinkedIn messages. Please don't send the template messages. I will not respond to templates. <laughs> sure, you'll get the in-mails in all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Michael, we uh, thank you so much for coming on the Passive Income Power podcast. Man, I've learned so much today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, great connecting. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, and, and thank you to our audience for listening to this episode. And uh, just remember to let us help you find your passive income superpower. So thanks, everyone. Thank you for watching the Passive Income Power Podcast. We hope you gained wealth building insights. I will ask you to do three things to help us serve you best. Go to our website at 2dinvestments.com, click on Investors Club, and fill out the basic information to have timely access to new offerings. Two, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And three, feel free to set up a call with Doug or Mickey through our website. We would love to help you find your personal superpower.